Welcome, we are finally covering the long-awaited UKF. The unscented common filter is perhaps the most robust Gaussian filter, and is flat out better than the extended common filter. The sampling technique used is beautiful and bypasses a lot of the complexities the EKF had while achieving greater performance. There are many, many variants of the UKF. However, there is no notable performance benefit, so I will be presenting the popular UKF variant linked in the description. Recall that the UKF is a Gaussian filter, so we approximate the probability distributions as Gaussians. To explain the UKF, we will cover the model setup, some intuition, the unscented transform, and put it all together for the UKF. The crux of understanding lies in the unscented transform, and we have five sections for that. In this model setup, we no longer require additive noise in our motion and sensor model functions. The reason we needed it before is because of the analytical derivation of the base filter equations. In particular, recall when employing the motion model, we needed p of xt given xt minus 1 in ut to remain a Gaussian distribution. In addition, we don't even need the Gaussian noise assumption either. Other than that, the notation is the same as before. To derive a specific filter from the base filter, recall that we need to perform a prediction and a correction step. Okay, so in the prediction step, we no longer need to analytically derive the equations. Instead, we'll overcome this with sampling. We don't even really need to care about our f function anymore. We can treat it as a black box function. This is why we no longer require assumptions on our noise. We have a Gaussian input distribution, which we will intelligently sample points from. We pass these sample points through our transformation function and then compute the best Gaussian fit. Really consider this statement for a second. In the EKF, we have an initial Gaussian distribution, which is an approximation of the true distribution. We then approximate our transform function and produce another approximated Gaussian distribution. In the UKF, we do indeed start with an approximated distribution, but we pass it through the true transform function, which is why this method is superior. As we can see, the goal of the unscented transform is the same as the step in EKF when we apply linearization, but the method is different. We are approximating how a distribution changes through a transform function by only considering samples of the distribution. Let's see how to do this mathematically. We need to unpack and understand the unscented transform. Some key questions are how many points to pick, how to pick them, and how to weigh each point. Let's consider if we can only pick one point. The obvious choice is the mean. Then, let's consider if our transform function is the identity function. If we just have a single point, the covariance is zero. So what if we pick points around the mean to recover the covariance? Note that these points that we are picking are called sigma points. So the paper picks sigma points like this. We choose two n plus one points where n is the dimension of our states. Point zero is going to be our mean, and points one to two n will be chosen symmetrically around our mean according to these formulas. Note, square root of sigma is the matrix square roots, and the ith index stands for the ith column. To understand the matrix square roots, we need to understand some properties of the covariance matrix. The definition of the covariance is the expectation of x minus mu times x minus mu transpose. Given this, we can clearly see that sigma transpose is equal to sigma. Next, to prove the positive semi-definite property, we need to show that u transpose times sigma times u will be greater or equal to zero for any vector u. Let's bring u into the expectation and note that since u transpose times x minus u is a scalar, it is equal to its transpose. Hence, we simply have the expectation of a squared scalar, which is always greater than zero. If sigma is equal to a a transpose, then a is the square root of sigma. Given these properties, the eigenvalue decomposition becomes a spectral decomposition. So we can decompose sigma in the following way. Performing some basic manipulations, we can see that the square root is u times the square root of lambda. Note that since lambda is diagonal, lambda equals lambda transpose. What is more commonly done in the literature is to perform a Cholesky decomposition, where sigma is equal to LL transpose. What is special is that L is lower triangular, and it is unique if sigma is positive definite. The reason of using the Cholesky decomposition is because it is very numerically stable. Some of you may ask the relation between these two methods. Well, we can inject an orthogonal matrix X in the middle of the spectral decomposition so that XX transpose is identity. Thus, there is a unique orthogonal matrix to relate the spectral and Cholesky decomposition. To pick the weights of our sigma points, we want to perform sigma point matching. The two moments we care about the most are the first and second moments, which are the mean and covariance. 
We choose our weights in the following way. Note that there are four weights, two for the covariance and two for the mean, because we distinguish the zeroth sigma point from all the others. To show you why, let's compute the mean of our sample points. The symmetric nature of how we picked our points cancels out to equal the mean. For the sample covariance, let's apply the definition. We see that chi naught cancels out since it's exactly equal to the mean. Next, let's plug in our weights, which is the same for all the remaining points. Now let's plug in chi i. We see the mean cancels out, and since we have the product of two of the same things, the plus or minus doesn't matter. We are left with a constant factor, which leads us to this form. Note that sigma is equal to LL transpose, which is simply the outer product of L, which is exactly what we have. Hence, the sample covariance perfectly matches sigma, the second moment. We match the first and second moments regardless of the tuning parameters alpha, beta, or kappa. These parameters control the spread of our sample points and how close they are to the mean. This image shows very popular default values for these parameters. Row 2 in the table is extremely popular, and you'll hear about beta equal to being optimal in the literature. This is because this allows our sample points to match up to the fourth moment of our Gaussian distribution, not just the first two. Okie dokes, it's UKF time. As input, we have the belief at the last time step, and UT and YT. The first step is to augment our state information with our information about the noise. For simplicity, we do the derivation with zero mean and covariance RT for the noise. Note that we don't include UT in these augmented vectors and matrices because it is not a random variable, whereas our belief distribution and the noise are random variables. Next, we compute our sigma points and weights according to our augmented state vector and covariance matrix. Then we decompose each sigma point back into state sample and noise sample. Using this, we pass it through our motion model. Lastly, we recombine the resulting samples into our intermediate belief distribution. The correction step is more involved. First, we need to understand another method that can be used to derive a Gaussian filter. It is called the generalized Gaussian filter. It can also lead to the derivations of the common filter and extended common filter. The first line is a joint Gaussian distribution between our state X and measurement Y. The second line is the corresponding conditional distribution. I've left the derivation on the screen and I'll link the textbook in the description, but the proof essentially just uses the sure complements plus some manipulations. Given this, the second line is exactly the final belief distribution we are after. So if we just plug in the correct values for mu of xt, mu of yt, and the covariance matrix, we arrive at the common gain and the final belief distribution. To reiterate, the second line and what's in the orange box are the same thing, except the orange box has the notation of the specific model setup we're using. So all we need to do is to find line 1, which is the joint distribution between the state and measurements. Step 1 again is just about combining our state and noise information. We then construct our sigma points and decompose them into our state and noise samples. Following, we pass them into our sensor model. But when we reconstruct our mean and covariance for our measurements, we can also compute our cross covariance between our state x and the resulting measurement y. Note that here the x samples are what we passed into the sensor model, g. So the cross covariance is essentially modeling how our state x influences the measurement y. With these quantities, we can simply fill out the generalized Gaussian filter, and we're done. That is the algorithm of the UKF. With the UKF, we don't need to actually know our motion and sensor models. In addition, we no longer need to compute Jacobians, which can be computationally complex. As a result, our models need no longer be continuous or differentiable, and the resulting computational complexity is similar to the EKF. Lastly, specific to Gaussians, the unsentence transform process is accurate up to the third order slash moment, because the third moment of any Gaussian is zero. Otherwise, the unsented transform is only guaranteed accurate up to the second order because we match the first and second moments. This high order accuracy is why the UKF performance is so good. There we go, that's the UKF. I know this may not be the easiest topic, so I'll try to answer any questions in the comments. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.